Greetings, everybody, and I hope that the Far Middle podcast has become a fun part of your weekly routine. And thanks for listening. Nick Peolius, your host, is always here. Episode 57 is up this week. Who will we dedicate this episode to? Well, someone who reached the pinnacle of his success in the year 1957. So 1957 or 57, that ties to our 57th episode. And this individual has the best nickname so far in Far Middle dedication history. And that nickname is the Upstate Onion Farmer. Now, this would be the nickname for a boxer, and it's not exactly a nickname that would strike fear in the heart of an opponent. But if you're going to fight this guy in the ring, you better be ready for a war. The person that we dedicate episode 57 to, who had the magical year in 1957, is boxing champ Carmen Basilio. And by the way, Carmen Basilio, he worked in the onion fields, hence his nickname, but he started working in those onion fields at age five, along with his nine siblings. So he wasn't a stranger to hard work and work ethic, which I'm sure helped him through his career. And you might have not heard of Basilio if you are not a dedicated boxing fan uh, like myself. But let me assure you, he was a great. He was born in upstate New York. Uh, That at the time was a hotbed of boxing talent through the years. He was champion in two weight divisions, so he got the belt in the welterweight uh, class as well as the middleweight class. And in 1957, that was his best year in many ways. In 57, he beat one of the greatest ever, Sugar Ray Robinson, for the middleweight title. And during that happened, I think, in, in late September of 57. Uh, because of that, or in large part because of that, he was Ring Magazine's Fighter of the Year in 1957. And in total, he earned that recognition five times. He lost the title to Sugar Ray Robinson the next year in a 1958 rematch. That one's an interesting fight. It went the full 15 rounds, and it was decided in a split decision, and a lot of boxing fans and experts thought that Basilio won the fight. His eye after that fight was completely swollen shut. It's one of the more famous photos in boxing lore. Now, Basilio's style, it was straightforward, and it was simple. He actually became sort of the epitome of what a lot of boxing aficionados reference when they call somebody or they tag someone an honest fighter. That was sort of, he he was the the poster child for that type of a a fighting style and approach. He wore you down and he outlasted you. Uh, He was willing to take a beating for as long as it took. And the beating showed. Some of his most famous photos, as I said, taken after his biggest bouts, including his biggest wins, it gave zero indication that he was the winner or that it was a a closely held contest. Um, These photos, they sort of give credence to the saying, if that's the winner, I'd hate to see what the other guy looks like. That was true for Basilio. But, you know, the approach that he used, it worked for him, and it propelled him to the highest levels of greatness in his craft. Despite the beatings that he took in the ring, uh, Carmen Basilio, he lived a full life to 85 years. Uh, He was a Marine. He worked at a beer factory after boxing. Uh, He was affiliated with a sausage company later in life. He testified to the United States Senate about organized crime because he took on the mob throughout his boxing career. A lot of the opponents that he faced uh, were backed by organized crime. Uh, He was no stranger to hard work and to sacrifice. It all paid off. Here's to the great Carmen Basilio in that magical year that he enjoyed back in 57. I mentioned that Basilio, he had lost a couple of crucial fights in his career to more than questionable split decisions. And a lot of experts speculate that organized crime, which had ties to some of his opponents, as I said, and the boxing in general, may have played a role. But whether or not organized crime was involved or not, it's actually beside the point because either event, the expert judges, they got it wrong at the worst time on the biggest of stages. And the idea of potentially rigged outcomes in a sport like boxing from expert judges who are presented as the infallible arbiters, that's going to kick things off with this week's connecting of dots to our next item, which is how many policies and regulations are justified off of, well, to be blunt, crap. And I will get to the crap descriptor explanation in a minute. But first, let me give you some context. The topic was something originally that I got focused on after reading what Andy Kessler of the Wall Street Journal wrote recently as being the two most dangerous words in the English language these days, which is studies show. Uh, That phrase, studies show, it's been applied by the administrative state and its allies increasingly in the last decade to justify and ram all kinds of damaging policies and regulations down the throat of the free market and private enterprise and the real economy. 
And the beneficiaries of that have been the special interests and corporate graft in general and the bureaucratic state. The losers, well, you know, there are many and they're important pieces of our society and economy because the losers have been taxpayers. The next generation who's ultimately going to have to pay the price of all this, or the cost of it, um, consumers, savers, value creators, basically the doer economy. And the article and thought in the article got me running down a rabbit hole before you knew it. And I found, obviously, that there's a sidekick to the studies show, Most Dangerous Pairing of Words, sort of a cousin to them, so to speak, and that is experts agree. Well, what if the reality is that 90% of studies are crap or that 90% of experts aren't worth a crap? Then following policies or prescriptions based off of them, that's going to be flawed, and we're going to end up with results that are crap. Now, all this 90% and crap talk actually has a theory tied to it. Sturgeon's Law, or Sturgeon's Revelation, depending on who you talk to, is an adage that states 90% of everything is crap. And the adage was coined by Theodore Sturgeon, an American science fiction author of all people. And it was inspired by Sturgeon's observation that while science fiction was often derided for its low quality by critics, the majority of examples of works in other fields could equally be seen as that of low quality, and science fiction was thus no different in that regard from anything else, including technical fields in other varied arenas such as psychology and politics and scientific theories and so on. So Sturgeon, he argued that sci-fi writing, it's no different than anything else, and just because most of it is crap does not make it more lowbrow or less worthy than any other forms of art or other areas of interest. Well, I think Sturgeon's Law applies to technical policy and science as well. I don't know if you knew this, but half of all studies in the arena of psychology, they can't be replicated. And we've already talked in prior episodes of the Far Middle how the vast majority of climate models have been shown to be grossly inaccurate. Now, why would these things be? What could be the root causes? Well, one root cause may be how scientific research and academia in the United States is incentivized. If you go back to the days of Franklin Roosevelt, when the government wished to scale science on a national level, the government started to incentivize certain behaviors in the key fields of research. So they started to look to things like the number of technical papers that one published as a researcher or as a university, uh, the number of students per professor, how much grant money the researcher or department and university secured, and so on. What FDR and his science director at the time created is performance metrics back then well, they prevail as strong and dominant as ever today in elite academia. And if the university knows that those are going to be the metrics that the government, which is the ultimate holder of the purse strings, desires to see trend in certain directions, you'll soon see the organization or the organism that is the university build itself and motivate its individual parts to manage to those metrics. What happened in the process was a loss of focus on the most important thing, the reason for the research to begin with, the quality of the results. And before you knew it, as technical papers were published at higher and higher rates, and studies showed more and more things, and funding skyrocketed from government, something else happened. 90% of what was produced as science or conclusive was crap. Sturgeon's Law reigns supreme over academia and its research that it publishes. Now what's chilling is to consider how much of this research what studies show and what experts agree on is crap. If someone close to the Sturgeon's Law of 90% applies, and we're using all this research to justify and set our policies and to dictate how we live our lives, we could be making huge miscalculations. We're not stopping the spread in the case of COVID. We're not avoiding a code red in a climate catastrophe. We won't be able to cover our federal debt and entitlement payments after all. We won't democratize China. And the actual consequences are going to do massive and serious and perhaps irreversible damage to all of us economically, socially, and or personally. So Sturgeon's Law might be the most crucial theory you never heard of, but not any more constant listener. Now today, all these experts and all these studies and all this research, they're used to accumulate a mountain of government regulations and control over the most basic of activities and actions in life. Think about it. Every rule, code, reg, every law, it's got some study, some expert, or a posited scientific rationale for it, 90% of it being potentially crap. 
the cumulative impact is so massive, yet because it was slow dripped, you know, piece by piece, step by step upon us, we take little notice of it anymore, which leads us to our next topical dot to connect. I posted something on Twitter and on LinkedIn recently, and you can follow me on both Twitter at Nick Deolius and just look me up Nick Deolius on LinkedIn if you'd like. So I posted something on both of those platforms recently that was the cover of a Bloomberg business magazine from a couple of years ago. And the title of the magazine was something like, is inflation dead? Question mark. And there was a photo or an illustration of a dead dinosaur laying there on the cover. And the point I made when I posted this was how experts, in this case economists, got the most basic of things in their field, inflation, wrong at the worst possible time. Because as I said, this magazine cover was only a couple of years old. And I then asked the question of why we still listen to these experts. Now, some of the feedback back that I got was, was interesting. One colleague in particular, a, a friend of mine, he responded with a comment online saying that we should listen but not blindly follow what experts say and that we should be the captain of our own ship. That got me thinking. Being a captain of your own ship, is it possible these days with omnipotent government everywhere you look? So for the far middle, I thought that a great exercise would be to take the analogy literally. What do you have to do when it comes to code, rules, regs, and laws to captain a boat in my home state of Pennsylvania? Well, after a little bit of research online, the answer is much more than you would ever anticipate. And I'm sure I'll list only some of the hoops that have to be jumped through and conditions that have to be satisfied. So first, you can't pilot a ship without a license. And boats need registered and need to have registration numbers displayed on their hulls. And emissions of the motor are going to be regulated. And what you catch in the water is regulated. When you run your boat is regulated when you can and when you can't. Where your boat can sail is regulated. Equipment that you must have on the boat, so things like fire extinguishers and life preservers, etc., they're stipulated by government. Regulations stipulate where life jackets and life preservers have to be placed on the boat. You can't water ski before sunrise or after sunset. You can't water ski if you have less than 20 foot of rope. You have to wear a life jacket when you water ski. Speed limits and no wake regulations are everywhere you look. And to moor a boat, you need a permit. Boats have to have a title tied to them. And you can't buy or sell the boats, of course, without title transfer. And that all has to be notarized. All boat operators need a boating safety education certificate. To get that certificate, you need to take a course. There are required running lights on boats and regulations that say when you have to have them turned on. Boats have to have a sound-making device that works up to at least half a mile. And boats with toilets need to be equipped with marine sanitation devices. So upon a little bit of review, or further review, no one in this country, at least in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, seems to be the captain of their own ship anymore. We all conform to the rigorous, complex, Byzantine maze of government rules, regulation, codes, and authority bodies. And we are not captains of our lives as much as we have become the food source for the bureaucrat. So this little exercise gets you thinking about the next topic I want to discuss. Are we better off with such stifling of free will and individual freedom? In the case that we just went through, in the case of boating in Pennsylvania, is it that much safer now because of all these rules and hoops? I doubt it. But every single rule, it had a great study that went with it, and it showed and was accompanied by an impressive expert who said we needed to do that. And step by step, over the years, all this stuff adds up to where we are today. And guess what? The march continues on because the bureaucrat and the state, they never sleep. Yet so much of life in the United States and in Europe over the past 200 years, it's proven that the exact opposite approach is what really works. That's the approach of a free market and embracing capitalism, those are the things that allow for achievement, they improve quality of life, and they serve the individual well in their quest to achieve. Which means, of course, you want a small and a minimal level of government that doesn't intrude into the market or mess with the individual's right to create value. Adam Smith, in his epic Wealth of Nations, of course, he was one of the great voices arguing these points. Uh, he viewed capitalism and the free economic exchange that came with it is things that are very similar to physical laws of nature. He viewed economic transactions and trade as natural as gravity. And the data over a long period of time, they prove Adam Smith and free markets as being the right way to go. Deidre McCloskey, uh, she's an author who writes extensively on this topic. 
And one of the things that she often writes about is what's called the Great Enrichment, which covers what has happened to the human condition from about 1800 to the present day. The Industrial Revolution, when you couple it with the free market, it's resulted in a 2,500% increase in the income the average human lives on, and that's in real and constant dollars. That 2,500% increase is the difference between famine and being fed. It's a difference between being diseased and being healthy. It's the difference between being illiterate and educated. And it's the difference, frankly, between death and life itself. And the benefits of the Great Enrichment have accelerated more recently over that lifespan from 1800 to present day. In 1960, so not that long ago, four out of the five billion people at the time on Earth were at roughly the same income or sustenance level of the 1800s average which was about $2 in constant dollars. Now today, only 1 billion of the 8 billion that are on planet Earth currently are at the $2 a day level. So areas, when you think about how this happened from 1960 to today, areas like Southern Italy, um, which is my ancestors' home, um, South Korea, those are great examples of how the past 60 years made these huge shifts in the numbers that I just quoted. And the experts on the left, they may not agree or the socialist studies may not show, but the reality is that capitalism and the free market and individual rights and minimal government, they vastly improve the human condition. Yet everything these days coming from those in power seems to be pushing us in the exact opposite directions. Now we can use that point or that observation to pivot to the next topic, which is how strange it is to see our current federal leadership go in the exact opposite direction from what the U.S. government has successfully employed as a playbook for 200 plus years. One of the central pillars of U.S. foreign policy for years, for decades, was to blend the domestic and foreign economic policies into a cohesive approach. There was a method to the madness. And that approach was part protectionist, which is an ideal, of course, but nevertheless, it was part protectionist. Um, so it wasn't perfect from an Adam Smith perspective, but it was what it was. And the protectionist piece of the policy formula was to shield key U.S. industries from foreign competition. Then you added pro-growth, pro-free market economic policy domestically to grow industries in the economy. Then the government didn't just allow, but it promoted export of U.S. goods abroad. That formula largely worked despite some of the protectionist aspects for 200 plus years, it wasn't perfect, but it was certainly effective. Alexander Hamilton devised it. Abraham Lincoln employed it. Teddy Roosevelt used it. Ronald Reagan. They all continued on with that general approach. But things started to change about 15 years ago with President Obama to the point now where our foreign policy and domestic economy and its policies aimed uh, to them are doing the exact opposite. You see it with energy. Domestic energy is probably the best example and then just energy policy in general. Obviously, energy is one of those crucial industries within the economy. Now, it used to be protected under the old way, perhaps too much, right, because of protectionist policies from foreign competition. But now the Biden administration is waiving solar import duties and tariffs from places like Vietnam uh, that are indirectly being procured through China. And domestic natural gas used to be a vital domestic energy that would be able to grow under pro-growth policies and limited regulation from government. But now you've got entities like the EPA who's strangling domestic energy, including natural gas, with all kinds of stifling anti-growth regulations. And it used to be encouraged by the federal government to not just achieve energy independence, but to export our energy products to allies. But now Massachusetts senators point to export and screen price gouging or corporate greed while our climate czar insists we abandon all domestic natural gas and all oil ASAP, let alone exports, and you can't get the infrastructure built to transport that product from where it's being produced inland to the coastal areas for export itself. And at the same time, these experts who agree willingly create dependence on places like China for our grid in the case of wind and solar. Basically, we are experiencing the exact opposite approach of Alexander Hamilton and Abraham Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt and Ronald Reagan when it comes to government, foreign, and economic policy. The successful statecraft formula for 200 plus years, it's been dropped in place of a set of policies that current experts agree on and that their studies show. 
why do I think this will end up in the sturgeon 90% is crap bin and not the desired 10%? And what was interesting, I think, about these issues as we discussed them in, in episode 57 here, because it, it in many ways ties to a bunch of different items that we've been talking about over the past year and that are brought up in my book, Precipice, The Left's Campaign to Destroy America. When you think about it historically, government was looking at economic policy, foreign policy, etc., to create... Um, abundance, abundance of crucial areas or industries, products, et cetera, innovation, all those types of things. And, and everybody enjoyed the fruits of that through the creation of value. But today, more and more of government and of the bureaucratic state is focused on creating scarcity, manufacturing scarcity where abundance once occurred. So as we sit here today, we see inflation at 40-year highs. That is the manifestation of government policy creating scarcity at work. We see a stock market that for however many weeks out of the past so many, we haven't had a negative run like this for uh, down weeks in succession or out of 10 consecutive weeks since the Great Depression. Okay, That is the manifestation of government instituting scarcity that will hit profitability and competitiveness of companies which then hit their stock valuations. We talk about what's happening with energy prices. Again, that is the byproduct, the residual of creating scarcity. If you can't build pipelines to transport the product, if you can't get permits to be able to increase your activity, if things are being done to manufacture cost into the equation, additional cost of producing uh, the natural gas or the oil or the kilowatt hour, that is going to basically create more scarcity. And you add all these things up. We also talked about some other sort of policy-driven issues that seem to have nothing to do with this topic, but actually it's the same theory. Right? We were talking about uh, a night that we spent in downtown Pittsburgh a couple of weeks back. One of the things that we talked about was traffic and traffic congestion. Well, what's happened is government policy has created scarcity of traffic lanes through things like bike lanes and traffic calming and all these different new uh, tools with uh, interesting euphemisms that are placed to them. But in the end, they're after one thing. They want to make it more painful to drive by basically limiting the number of lanes that different cars and, and traffic can occupy within an urban area. So all these different things that we've talked about through the past year plus of the far middle, one of the things that they all share in common, these policies in the end always seem to be aiming to either increase the cost of or reduce the supply, the abundance of the issue at hand. And that's a strange and an exact opposite target or objective of government policy when, again, you look at what Alexander Hamilton was thinking government policies, foreign, economic, et cetera, should be doing, or Teddy Roosevelt, or Ronald Reagan, or Abraham Lincoln, or all the different leaders of the nation that basically over 200 plus years uh, created unprecedented growth, abundance, and uh, enjoyment, quality of life for all. We're going to bring it home for episode 57 of The Far Middle, and we will do so sticking with Sturgeon's 90% is crap rule. But let's end with talking about the 10% that is great and that is genius and that is awesome. As I said, Sturgeon came up with that 90% rule in defense of the 10%, ironically, of sci-fi writing that he felt was great. And his point was sci-fi was no different than anything else in art or life. 90% is going to stink or is going to fail. Now, some of you have asked me for my recommendations on summer reading and what I thought fell in the 10% that is awesome, that category. So here's a few suggestions. Um, now, most of these, in fact, are not anything close to being new books. And I think there's a lot of lists out there for new books that are out, new releases. You can reference all kinds of different experts in that arena. I figured instead that I'd give you a bunch of camp misses, uh, most of them from the past, you pick one or two that you haven't read, but they're all classics nonetheless. And I will give you a recommendation for different types of categories of topics that you may like or prefer. And maybe you've likely heard of a few or you've read a few, but I'm guessing you haven't read them all yet. So let's start with military history. If you like military history, give any Stephen Ambrose book a read. Uh, he was a prolific author of military history and general history. Um, he's most noted, I think, for World War II and his writing on that. He wrote Band of Brothers, which became the cable TV hit. But any of his books are worth the read. So pick a topic historically that you're most interested in by Stephen Ambrose and, and pick that book up. You'll enjoy it. If you like culture and you like uh, culture essays and maybe some political essays or political culture, right, 
pick up a book of Joan Didion's essays from the 60s and 70s. So she you know, was a very um, prolific writer, of course, just passed away not recently within the past year or so. Um, but in the 60s and 70s, I think she did her best work. And there's different collections of her essays. I think her essays were most the most effective of her writings. So some genius stuff there. Uh, she was awesome. Slouching Toward Bethlehem is probably her, her best single piece. Um, a colleague of Joan Didion's at that time was Tom Wolfe. And if you like technology and adventure, The Right Stuff is for you. That's an awesome book by Tom Wolfe. Way better than the movie version, but that's usually the case, right? Books are usually better than the movie versions. If you desire some solitude and getting in tune with nature, if that's the mood you're in, uh, you can't go wrong with The Rose Walden. It never gets old. Uh, you can reread it over time. I've, I've read Walden a number of times through my life, and every time I read it, I get a different perspective and a different angle on it. Uh, it's a great book for something like a, a summer vacation. If you like historical fiction, I'm a big fan of historical fiction. There's a guy out there, Eric Larson, and it's L-A-R-S-S-O-N. His books are epic. Uh, any of his books are great. My favorite is Thunderstruck. Um, but I think you'll really enjoy that if you like historical fiction. You, you sort of learn something. Um, it's a bit uh, of a drama that he takes some some liberties in, in writing the storyline. It's, it's a great combination uh, to be entertained by. If you want a great um, rock music biography, amazingly, Keith Richards' bio, it's called Life. It's really good. I'm shocked that that guy remembered way more than I thought he would have considering all the partying and uh, in substance abuse that he engaged in through the years. But it's a really good read. And you learn a lot about sort of uh, the history of the group, the Rolling Stones, of course, and, and sort of his journey um, through all of that. If you like sci-fi, like Sturgeon, and you're looking for a classic, Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, timely as ever. It's like when that guy wrote it in the UCLA library basement, uh, he sort of foresaw what was going on in, in 2022. I wrote an essay on that one, on how that story came about and the parallels to today on nickdelius.com. If you want to give it a look, it's under the commentary tab uh, under literature. But um, Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, can't go wrong with that one. Um, political and historical bios, American Ulysses, that's on General and President Grant. It's great. Uh, the author is Ronald White, uh, one of the better historical bios that you will read. Uh, what a story and, and what a great American Ulysses Grant was. If you want a road trip book, so you want a book about traveling and road trips, John Steinbeck, his book, Travels with Charlie. Now, I think you guys know from prior episodes that I love John Steinbeck. I read all his stuff. I went to his museum in Northern California uh, that they dedicated to him. Um, no one talks about this book, uh, Travels with Charlie. It is a travel log that Steinbeck made while circumventing the country in a camper with his dog, Charlie. And I believe it's the last book that he wrote before he passed away. Uh, so when you're on a road trip, it's a great book to read about a road trip. So that's a, that's a good one, Travels with Charlie. If you like drama, suspense, and tech, one of my favorite authors of all time, Michael Crichton. Um, State of Fear is a particularly good one and another one that resonates very loudly today uh, with what's going on with environmentalism. And again, experts agree and uh, studies show that sort of uh, whole issue that we covered in episode 57. And then last but not least, if you like suspense and horror, I've mentioned before I'm a big Stephen King fan. I know that's sort of lowbrow for a lot of literary experts, but I love the guy. Uh, I mentioned before in a prior episode, The Institute is a more recent book uh, that's a really good story and a really good read. Unless, of course, you haven't read The Stand by Stephen King, in which case, if you've not read The Stand, ladies and gentlemen, you drop everything right now, run to the store or go online, order that book and start reading it. It's, it's an awesome, awesome story. I'll talk to you next week with a fresh new episode. Till then, stay out of the 90% that is crap and toil on in a 10% that is great.